All right. So, hey everyone, I'm Matt from the storage systems team at DigitalOcean from out in Eastern Canada. Uh, this is how we operate Ceph at scale. Got uh, 24 slides and like 20 minutes to do it, so there's a lot of content here. I'm basically going to speed run it. Uh, quick run through of the agenda. I'll talk about uh, a little bit about what DO is. Uh, I'll move on to our use of Ceph at DO, uh, how we approach automation and what we use it for, which leads into operating clusters. I'll also spend a bit of time talking about observability, uh, finish off with some reflection, not just with Ceph, but our approaches as well. And we'll wrap up with some time for a hiring plug and some Q&A. So what is DigitalOcean? We are a cloud provider founded in 2012 on the core concept of simplicity. We started with the droplet, $5 SSD backed VM, which was very attractive in 2012. 2016, we introduced a second product, which is volume, Ceph backed uh, detachable storage. Since then, product portfolio has grown significantly, including spaces in 2017, which is Ceph backed S3 compatible object storage offering, along with DBAS, DOKS, App Platform, LBAS, and more. Uh, we have a bunch of data centers, nine different regions, a uh, bunch of different metro choices. Uh, it gives our customers uh, like a dozen choices to place their resources. Uh, we had an IPO a couple years ago, and stonks means for everyone. So let's talk about uh, Ceph DO. Uh, Ceph, Ceph use at DO continues to grow. Uh, it's used directly for block and object storage, which powers both uh, volumes and spaces, and other teams make very heavy use of volumes and spaces for many of DO's product offerings that I had mentioned previously. Uh, some of the stats at DO, uh, we have 58 clusters in total. 47 of them are in production that are running Pacific. We have eight in staging. Some of the staging ones are Reef. We're a bit behind the times, but we're a lot better than we were uh, a couple years ago. More than uh, 200 petabytes of raw storage in Ceph. Our biggest cluster is over 12 petabytes. This does not include the droplet backup, snapshot, or bring our own image storage, which is pretty staggering in itself. More than 28,000 OSDs and 1,600 servers running Ceph. We're a very small team, about, uh, about uh, five ICs, and this is a lot to manage. So automation tooling time. Uh, for time, I've skipped like the rack and stack and the, the handoff journey, and we're just going to assume here that we've got a bunch of bare metal sitting in an OS ready for our team to consume. So Chef is used for a lot of the core OS stuff. Uh, gen this is general config management. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it'll do things like make sure that we can run Docker containers. Uh, we use Ansible for a lot of things that are uh, Ceph specific, such as deploying a cluster from scratch, augmenting a cluster with more nodes. AWX is an open source self-hosted solution for running Ansible playbooks. With it, we're able to share failure modes in the team, keep secrets secret, and have a detailed history of the runs. We still write uh, some one-off bash scripts from time to time where the automation doesn't make sense. This is often due to us understanding it as being a one-off uh, at the time, which, you know, that, that doesn't always happen. So we fully document these in tickets with context just because sometimes it gets uh, moved or promoted into a playbook. Uh, just don't let uh, perfect be the enemy of progress here. So the bulk of our automagic lies in the Ansible playbooks. Ultimately, this is what allows us to operate Ceph at scale. It's not particularly new or innovative, but it is cool to see a bunch of YAML turn bare metal into user consumable storage. As mentioned previously, new cluster deployments and augments are done through the, these playbooks. Augments tend to come in two forms, adding disks or adding hosts. We handle both of them in a similar way by expecting an increasing number of disk counts on each node, though in practice we don't do disk augments. We just deploy hosts full of disks. We have uh, node pre-flight checks, which will ensure certain conditions are met before a node may join a cluster, including network reachability. Uh, node reboots will safely reboot any of our nodes that we need to, either ad hoc whenever we want to, or just when required for kernel updates or the likes. Uh, we set our node and central uh, config management up using these Ansible playbooks. We can reconfigure it at, wet, at will very quickly. Ceph upgrades are also done through these playbooks, and this is very easy because we use a containerized deployment. OSD restarts can be done at host, uh, host at a time or one at a time, and it'll wait for the recovery to complete before moving on. Since we've been running these things for a very long time, we, they eventually get old, we need to shut them down. This kind of teardown is largely handled by the automation, but today it does not include getting the data off of the clusters. This is something we're working on promoting to a service. Uh, some of the utilities and goodies in here that we make a lot of use of to make all of the other stuff work include uh, Ceph Wait Healthy as like one of the widest used roles in Ansible. It ensures that the cluster's in an expected state before continuing. It's, uh, like de determining health is super simple for a script and super boring for a person, and we let the script uh, determine safety as appropriate. There are node maintenance up and down roles that'll safely pull any type of node out, in and out of service. Uh, global maintenance locks that use Rados locks before progressing. It's just primitive concurrency control mechanism that leverages the target cluster. 
Uh, this includes disk replacement when destroying an OSD or when deploying a new one, we usually hold the lock. We, and we have the, like the standard Slack utilities that'll let interested parties know when uh, things are happening as they happen. As I had mentioned, many of the products use our services. We like to let them know when we're doing maintenance. Uh, this also ties into our secret storage in order to push in, create uh, new key rings as needed. So a quick note about the automation, it thrives on consistency and snowflakes are inherently inconsistent. Unfortunately, some winters bring more snow than others. When doing uh, your operations, try to think about how one change on a cluster today might affect your assumptions tomorrow across the entire fleet. Some ways your clusters might end up be being different from other ones or even different nodes in the clusters might differ. You'll have hardware configurations or the easiest deviation, especially as drives go into life and you start to mix in the next generation. Centralized config can change between these clusters, but you might also forget that like a single OSD was given a specific config option at one time and now you, you wiped it out when you restarted or something. Uh, there might be a long running script in the background that you just completely forgot about and now you and the balancer are fighting each other and you're just standing there confused. Um, augmenting the clusters can also affect the lifetime of a cluster, just like disk replacements. Uh, adding a bunch of new nodes to a cluster that's a couple years old may be a very confusing game for the, uh, the finance folks. And similarly, just replacing disks in a cluster that's slated for decommission just may or may not make sense. I uh, highly recommend trying to melt your snowflakes. Make sure they're all part of the same puddle. Uh, let's talk about the Ceph deploy playbook. This is a big one. Uh, I'm just skimming here, but basically there are safety checks along the way that uh, ensuring like all of the drives are the same size for a host, for example. Uh, we create system D units for daemons, configure manager modules and more throughout this process. Uh, so it's easier said than done, but we do the standard dance of creating a mon map, deploy the mons, ensure a quorum. We want to then create our OSDs and pre-populate the crush tree ahead of time. This is super simple because we have an Ansible inventory and with that inventory we have attributes about placement, like the rack, the number of disks, whether it's an index node, a data node. And we have a tool that automates generating this inventory from us, from an internal uh, tool. Uh, next up we deploy the OSD containers and just start them across the entire cluster. This is also very simple because we just enumerate the disks on the host. We have a tool that wraps set volume LVM be and because the crush tree was pre-populated, this can be done in parallel across the cluster. Finally, we do a quick verification that all the OSDs that we expected to create were created and started. We also check cluster health at this point and verify that the cluster is as healthy and as bored as it ever will be. In the future, we'd like to fire this off uh, automatically after, ge after generating the inventory from completed tickets during our handoff. This would be an example of promoting some automation to a service, though it's effectively just orchestrating playbook launches. Now, one of the biggest post-deployment operations we'll have is a capacity augment. Uh, now, block and object used to vary slightly for us. Deploying the OSDs in their containers was the same, but giving them PGs was different. Block is to slowly upweight the OSDs over time to mitigate peering latency. This was done using an open source tool that we've built called Archimedes, but we've since uh, archived it since it we no longer find it useful now that we have PG Remapper. So we use PG Remapper. It's also open source. Uh, Dan, give a shout out to it. Thank you. Uh, this cancels remapped backfill via upmaps. It slowly undoes them in a loop, which brings PGs back to these new OSDs. Uh, this is done because object traditionally had slower hardware. Uh, where flapping OSDs was just not uncommon. The recovery weight from these flaps would keep getting put off by ongoing backfill and then the recovery weight would themselves be turned into backfill weight and this just kind of snowballed into never ending tears. Uh, we mostly use PG remapper and object to maximize, maximize backfill concurrency and minimize the degradation. The same works really well in block but we drive less concurrency there due to workload latency sensitivity. Uh, it's possible now that we could make use of just the upmap balancer for both products after we cancel all the backfill. The balancer would then just start to opportunistically remove upmaps that aren't needed and we could turn it off if necessary. We wouldn't get the same kind of concurrency control from the balancer though. Uh, we stopped augmenting our, our block clusters uh, and are instead just doing new clusters for growth. This minimizes our blast radius when things go wrong and really forces us to think about automated, automated approaches first. So now we've got a cluster, it's released to the world, it's no longer bored, and we have to keep this thing running and up to date, handle failure modes and do all sorts of maintenance. So some planned operations as the cluster augments and capacity management were, uh, were discussed, but OSD restarts either, I mean they happen due to updating Ceph, disk failures, simply flapping, we've got a case of the slows. Uh, node, node reboots will keep a kernel up to date, um, nodes failing due to bad RAM, anything in the network, slack, uh, network stack, solar flares, you name it. 
all of these things will cause PGs to start peering. During peering, no IO can happen on these PGs, and while peering is very quick on our block clusters, it's never going to be faster than our sub millisecond P99 read. Now, this can cause some cascading issues to our very latency sensitive customers. This is less important on the object clusters because HTTP overhead and latency usually take longer than the PGs take to peer. So to give a bit of an idea, this uh, P99 read latency graph, and you might be able to tell where the OSDs were restarted. It's important to note that we measure this from inside the cluster against a real RBD image. Uh, this tool is specifically built to measure IO latency. There's no other application logic. Uh, some latency sensitive applications with high transaction rates might feel this a lot more than most applications. This tool is uh, called Merigraph that generates these for us. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. So what can we do about this latency? We have a couple options to look at. We can reduce the Paxos proposed interval from its default to two seconds to a quarter second as suggested by Sage on the mailing list there. However, we observed that this actually made things a little bit worse. We can, start, we can try starting the OSDs without letting their PGs actually peer by setting no up. We can then check their admin socket for their current status and wait for them to hang out at preboot. Once all the OSDs for a host are at preboot, we can then unset no up, which will allow the PGs to begin peering and reduce the OSD map updates. Now we get to deal with you know, recovery overhead on the cluster for a little bit. But we know we'll never be able to eliminate that peering latency in an immediately consistent storage system. However, we've, we can make some progress towards minimizing it. It helps those applications that are really the most sensitive to latency. So taking a look at this graph, uh, zoomed way in further on this one to reduce some of the noise and to show the difference. Uh, combining the no up trick with the Paxos proposed interval set to Sage's recommendation, we see a great improvement to latency during peering. So that's block. What about some tricks in object? We've uh, got some clusters with billions and billions of objects. I can't show the numbers, but it's kind of nuts. Uh, the RGW index layer doesn't handle that very well when we have buckets beyond, uh, way beyond the uh, 100,000 object shard uh, rule of thumb. Having too many shards is, of course, going to negatively impact uh, list performance. Uh, we're spending a lot of time in RocksDB, either iterating over tombstones or otherwise, as a result of suboptimal compaction. This is a lot of time spent in RocksDB code that isn't spent serving customer traffic. So it's important to note here that we aren't pointing the finger at either RGW's interaction with RocksDB or, or uh, RocksDB itself, but the scale that we're at is simply not what the RGW defaults are tailored for, though it has proven very capable of handling our scale when tuned. So we've had a couple of wins here since Nautilus. First, setting OSD async recovery min cost to zero was a big win with async recovery on our index layer. Once we hit Nautilus, you know, back, in, back in the old days, uh, we had access to TTL compaction. And when stale data reaches a certain age, uh, compaction will be triggered within the file within RocksDB. With that, the load on our index nodes consistently higher now than it was previously, but this trade-off is absolutely worth it. This higher load is not worrying at all. We've got plenty of headroom, and the nodes just simply aren't bored anymore. So index utilization in a capacity sense, however, has dropped a staggering amount. Some OSDs freed up like double digits percentages of their use. Uh, we've since disabled periodic compaction in favor of TTL compactions, and this has been like the biggest silver bullet for our index stability in the last few years. Uh, actually, I think since 2021. Um, going one step further, now uh, we've got compact on delete. Has it been introduced by Mark Nelson and the link change? It's currently enabled by default in main. It's available both in 12.2.15 and 18.2.2, but it's disabled by default in Pacific, enabled by default in Reef. Uh, Josh Bergen on our team also found out that this was not iterating over the default ca uh, column family within RocksDB, which affected upgraded clusters, which hadn't yet resharded RocksDB. So he went and fixed that. Um, perhaps compact on delete might be mis misleadingly named. Uh, it'll trigger compactions on iteration when it finds tombstones based on given options. So there are a couple, couple options for it. First, uh, flag that simply turns it on and off. And then there's a sliding window which will define the number of entries which we observe. And a trigger value that will look within that sliding window of entries to observe for the number of tombstones to count. Uh, once it, it finds that number, it'll trigger a compaction. We're still using a six hour TTL on our index nodes, but we've backported this uh, compact on deletion to our Pacific branch and defaulted it to on for all of our OSDs. And we haven't done the discovery on it yet, but we might be able to actually drop TTL compaction in favor of compact on delete on our index nodes. So finally, we wanna make sure that all these clusters are doing what we expect. 
I'll talk a bit about the tools we use to collect everything and some of the more important but slightly subtle metrics that we've learned to keep an extra eye on. First, similar to Ceph ADM, uh, the manager Prometheus module was not available to us when we started, so we wrote an open source Ceph exporter. Ceph exporter is written in Go and doesn't rely on the manager, which uh, has had some scaling issues in the past, but otherwise it accomplishes the exact same thing. Uh, we like to keep an eye on our fill rates and projections for cluster capacity. This is more important, I mean, in recent years, supply chain issues have been kind of terrifying for lead times. So this is a bit different th from having the finger on the pulse of what capacity is at today. We want to understand weekly, monthly, and even yearly trends. We also wrote something called Store Exporter, which runs on each host, and this will talk to the admin sockets for a ton of extra insights. This can also check the hardware on a host, uh, such as reading the smart info, get to get uh, reallocated sector info, power on hours, that kind of thing. Uh, these are very useful metrics to help identify if a drive is headed towards a failure. You start getting an idea for how many writes a uh, drive can take over its lifetime and how long that lifetime might be. We also monitor network reachability to every other host using uh, basically just wrapping FPing uh, with an expected MTU and no fragment flags. Uh, if this is ever flaky, we might have some gray failures on a single link in a cluster, which can cause an entire world of confusion. Network monitoring for these sorts of things can be very tricky, but identifying a single cable that's failed in some way uh, can save you a, a, from digging into unrelated areas of your stack that hasn't failed in any way. So using something like Prometheus or uh, Alert Manager's inhibit rules can help you alert on only that network issue instead of all the consequences of it. So we have this other tool called Merigraph that I talked about. Uh, this is how we measure the cluster latency. It's very useful. We're going to dig into it in a minute. Um, it's been very important for our block workloads. Um, and I mean, with all things monitoring, you should only alert on the things that you can actually take action on. Informative alerting isn't actionable. That's kind of what your graphs are for. So Merigraph. This is the synthetic workload that works continuously against every single cluster in our fleet. We export some very useful latency metrics about this workload. Uh, we have dashboards that show us IO timeouts, uh, read-write latencies for the average, median, P90, P99, and P100s, uh, along with an IO rate and histogram graphs for those read-write latencies. Uh, it's got an IO rate cap and a Q depth. Those are variable. And again, it's important to note that this runs within the cluster, which means it does not capture the effects of a hypervisor or the network between the droplet and the customer, or between the droplet and the cluster. Uh, it has helped us identify a bunch of issues we've wanted to track down over the years. We've been able to observe the effects of flipping buffered I.O. back and forth, you know, half a dozen times. Uh, we've observed a bump in write latencies on our older clusters when we upgraded to Pacific due to write amplification. And we also saw a bump in graphs that was ultimately caused by a backlog of discards on a specific drive. And more on this will follow in my lightning talk here. Um, a quick look at some of these latency graphs. This is a 30-day look at a test cluster. I have absolutely no idea what workloads we're running over this time, but there's, there, I mean, there's a slight ripple there, so there's probably something, but we like to see these really long, flat, boring lines. This is exactly the kind of stability that we're after. So closing up, a little bit of reflection here. Look at how we might do things differently. We spent a bunch of time with a division between our block and object teams. This meant that we treated our clusters different very differently. Automation and configuration largely diverged, creating a, a, just a lot of confusion and duplicate and inconsistent work. Throughout the life cycle of a cluster, there are multiple sources of truth for things where Chef and Ansible could have gotten their information from. If some of that were minimized, it would reduce a lot of confusion. Uh, using the centralized conf instead of sc uh, scattered ceph.conf files in the early days would have also been the same. Uh, we have a lot of automation now, and some of it's getting pretty complicated. Some of that might be better off as services. But just like determining whether something's worth automating, that line to promote automation to a service and then finding the time to actually do that is very challenging. So also just like melt all your snowflakes. If again, a unique cluster is going to become a problem someday, somehow. Uh, if all the snowflakes melt together, they all become part of the same digital ocean.